uh, Matt, your, your game did not start in the 1500s, but Josh, your game, Pentiment, does start in the 1500s. I know Matt and Chris got a lot of recommendations to, to play this game, which is like, could you just talk a little bit about Pentiment? It's like, uh, how would you describe it? It's like a murder mystery set in like medieval Bavaria. And I'm just wondering, like, how did you come up? Like, where, where was the genesis for the idea behind this game? Yeah, it's um, it's a uh, really modern um, <laughs> murder mystery. It's a it's a adventure role playing game, and uh, yeah, it takes place in. It starts in 1518 in the fictional uh, Bavarian town of Tassing and Kearsaw Abbey, and uh, yeah, you're an artist who is uh, spending the the end the end of his Wanderjahre, his sort of journeyman years, working in a dying scriptorium in a, uh, an abbey, a Benedictine abbey. And then a murder happens and you get caught up in it. And then you spend the next, not entirely, but you essentially spend the next 25 years trying to not only solve that murder, but a series of other murders and a whole load of other issues that come up. Um, but the idea from it came from, uh, I went to college, got a degree in early modern history. And when I got into the games industry, I wanted to make I wanted to make D&D games and I wanted to make a Fallout game and the other game that I wanted to make was a historical game and nobody else was interested in it. And then <laughs> 20 years passed and I convinced my boss to let me make it. And uh, yeah, that's how it went. Finally solved that murder. Talk about a Talk about a cold case. Yeah. Um, but like, what, what are some of like the, the influence on this? Because, you know, you're talking about an early modern murder mystery set in an abbey you know the name of the rose comes to mind but i'm just wondering like what was the what was some of the research that went into this and like uh like what were some of the ideas that you discovered like researching the game or that you learned in studying early modern period in college that you wanted to communicate in the in the game's medium yeah i mean uh name of the rose was obviously influential just in its overall kind of tone and and um you know just the the fundamental idea behind it but in terms of the stuff that I wanted to communicate, I've always been interested in the early modern period because it is full of so much upheaval. I mean, you can say that that's true of almost any historical period, but, um, you know, print and the rise of print and the dissemination of ideas to ordinary people um, in vernacular languages, which I know you, you spoke about um, in your series on the Hundred Years' War. Like, that was obviously greatly influential, and I think that's very important to understand the impact that that had on not it wasn't class consciousness at the time, but it, it became the foundation of that, I think. Um, and also, I think a lot of studying micro history really reveals that we're we're all kind of the same. <laughs> We've always been the same kind of people for centuries and millennia. And a person living in 1518, you know, lives in different material conditions, but they're basically like us. Um, and they're they're quite varied in their intelligence and their outlook on things. They can form their own ideas. And so trying to dispel some of the ideas of like monolithic cultural swaths, like everyone in the church is kind of like this and all peasantry is kind of like this. Um, and Catholics drive you know, a car like this. Protestants drive yeah. a car like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like I just, I wanted to kind of show, um, you know, a, a little, a little society that represented all of these things and a lot of diversity within it, diversity of thought and opinion and outlook. And um yeah, that was kind of the stuff that I wanted to get across. I was uh, very impressed by the well poisoning side mission in, in in your video game, Josh. No, I'm just kidding. That's that's not in the video. <laughs> maybe it is. I'm so <laughs> I was like, damn, I don't remember that one. Uh, well, I mean, like, so this is a you know it deals with like a lot of history, but this is this is a murder mystery as well. And I'm just wondering, like, what's it like? writing a murder mystery about a time before modern forensics, because like, you know, you watch TV, it's just all about uh, DNA and getting the, getting the UV light to look at all the fluids and stuff like that. But like, how did you approach writing a story in which someone went about trying to solve a murder in the 1500s? Um, you know, it, it was not, I did not try to make it like a Sherlock Holmes mystery in a, for a few reasons. One echo already did that very well with William of Baskerville and name of the Rose. But um, I actually wanted to, I wanted to play with how much ambiguity there really was. Like there weren't, there weren't detectives. There was not really forensics. And a big point of the game is that you are put in a position where you're not actually equipped to make a, a very well-informed decision about who the guilty parties are. And that's something that comes up when you wind up accusing people of these murders is that uh, unlike a lot of games that deal with murder mysteries, you are never told actually who the killer is. You just kind of have to, put someone away and, and they die and then people are pissed at you. 
and maybe it's people that you care about and maybe it's people who you don't give a shit about their opinion, but they're gone and you did it. Um, and you did it without really much evidence at all. It's all very circumstantial or, or it's mostly your opinion. And of course, that's not necessarily the case in, in all circumstances. But yeah, the early modern period was not one where there was a lot of hard and fast evidence. And in fact, the whole legal system was just entirely different. Like the structure of it was just fundamentally different. So uh, really, it wasn't about you finding a bunch of clues and piecing together the one true solution. It was about you navigating through this um, community and learning about all these people and their different motivations and then kind of deciding for yourself. And maybe it's not even a question of guilt, but who do you want to pay for this? Who do you want to die for this? And that might very well be the person who you don't think is the guilty party. Um, or if you just say, like, I have no fucking idea, but I hate this dude. <laughs> They're gone. Um, and so that's, it's kind of trying to put the player in that circumstance, which is very unusual for a game that's kind of about a murder mystery. In terms of uh, like writing the plot to this or, or running any of the games you've worked on, I'm, I'm interested in... Like if you're writing a, like a screenplay or a comic book or a novel, short story, whatever, it's like you as the writer are essentially God of this universe and, and you create it and like you're in control of every detail of it. And like the, 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 the stranger, the third party who's like communing with your work is put into a universe you've created and they have to kind of uh, metabolize it in their own way. But like in, in creating a game that's, that's plot and character driven, how do you use the writer change? Like, how does it change when you, when you, the idea is not to create a universe in which you are the god of it, but to put like an unnamed third party, a stranger to you, essentially, in the position of becoming god of a world that you've created for them? Like, what challenges does that present to you as a writer or creator? Um, I think you know one of the big things is that whenever you're sort of saying that you are an agent in the story and you're actually active, you're not just kind of clicking through it. Um, there's a, a range of like you are playing in a vessel of a character that exists in this time and place. So for example, you're playing Andreas Mahler and Andreas is Bavarian. He is, you know, from Nuremberg. He is, well, I guess you'd say he's Franconian, but um, he is, um, he is Catholic and there are certain things about him that are sort of fixed. And then there are other things that are not fixed in terms of his attitude, how he lives his life. Um, and we're saying to the player, we're going to give you a spectrum of choices. Those are not unbounded choices because we can only author so much until the great age of AI comes. But um, until that day comes, like we're giving you a spectrum of choice and that spectrum of choice is presented to sort of um, give a range of expression that feels true to the authored character while also allowing you to explore the complex, the moral complexity of the world that you're in. Um, in a lot of cases, we ask the player to make choices about whether to speak up or shut up or be deferential, um, be kind, be brutal or rude. And those things have outcomes. Um, and so to a certain extent, we're, we need to create a space uh, for the player, but there's also a range of expression in there. So it's a difficult balancing act. I mean, I've worked in role-playing games for my entire career, and every game is a new chance to kind of look at how much, how much expression do we want to give to the player versus the the plot that we want to sort of move forward, if that makes sense. Yeah. You said, you mentioned that uh, you always wanted to do sort of D and D style games and that you've been working in, in role-playing games your, your whole career. Uh, did you play uh, D and D or tabletop role-playing games as a kid? And like, if so, what did they teach you about writing and, and, and the, the career that you have now? Yeah, I played them a lot. I mean, I started when I was 10, so that's a long time ago now, 30, 37 years ago. Um, and I still play tabletop role-playing games and, I think the big thing is that, you know, at a certain level, D&D is a war game, but, you know, it's a collaborative storytelling thing and not to not to get too highfalutin about it. But, you know, there's a person running the game and then there are the people playing in it and they're making choices and decisions. And when it's fun, you know, like when everyone's having a good time, it does really feel like you're col being collaborative, even if there are moments of antagonism. And I think as a dungeon master, because I usually was the person running the games, you know, I found that as the dungeon master, my players generally had a better time when um, I, you know, allowed them to poke at things and change things and flip the table over um, in the game, so to speak. Um, and then as a player, I also appreciated that when the people running the game would let me kind of do wild shit and like, you know, flip out and not follow the script. And, um, you know, we want to have a satisfying story, but part of it is that we're involved in it. It's not that's what makes it kind of a fun thing is that we're doing our own thing and we have our own stories within 
the larger story that uh, the DM is sort of constructing and the other players are making as well. So I think that's the thing. When I got into D and D, like obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of stats and spells and shit, but you know I think the heart of it for me was really that collaborative storytelling environment, which is why Pentiment really you know it doesn't have stats, but it still has the 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 player as a, a partial author of the story that moves forward.